All right, this is Boston Jimmy with Stogie Press, and I have the pleasure of sitting here today with John Uber, president of Crown Heads, co-owner. I, I got a promotion. Yeah, kind of. We don't really do a lot of titles here. Okay. Um, I guess you could say co-founder, co-owner, kind of. Co-founder, co-owner of Crown Heads. We're at Crown Heads headquarters here in Nashville, Tennessee. So, so John, um, you're a Nashville resident. I am. Born and raised. No. No. No, born in San Francisco, lived there until I was 17, moved to L.A., went to school, moved out here in like 95-ish. It's been a while. So, But I've lived in, in Nashville longer than anywhere, so I kind of consider myself a resident by default. So this yeah, is your home. This is home. This is home. Absolutely. So the, the history of this company, so there's a lot of my viewers that might be in millennial world, maybe they're not as familiar with crown heads. Um... There's a lot of history of this company. This company, and you and your partner, Mike, right. go back to CAO. Correct. So talk a little bit about the CAO experience before Crown Heads. So I vividly remember my first day working at CAO was April 15th, 96. So I've been in the, this is all I've done for most of my life, so this is all I really know how to do. But, um, and at that time, it was just this very small, family-owned, business where we would literally, we had a little office in West Nashville, and we would get our orders in through a fax machine, right? I don't know if anyone remembers fax <laughs> machines. And we would tally up what we needed, and then we would drive this guy's pickup truck to the owner's house, to John's house, which was about a mile away, and then he had this little wine cellar, and that's where we kept the cigars. So we would be like, okay, I need three boxes of Presidente, I need four boxes of Triangulare, da 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 drive them back, pack everything up by hand, manual log on the UPS. It was very, like, basic. Um, and then you fast forward, like, within 10 years, that cigar company was, like, you know, through the, through the roof. It was, it, was, it was an interesting ride, for sure. But it, some of the best times of my life was working at CAO, for sure. So in 2010... That's when we... Adios. They got bought out by Swedish Match... Actually, in I believe it was 08, 08. Henry Winterman's sold or acquired um, from the Oscar family. So that, you know they came in, they said nothing's going to really change. You know we we like what you guys do. And so you know you kind of buy into that for a minute, and then like a year later you start seeing these people come into the office. Like who was that guy and who was you know? And then then I remember one time in 2010 there was couple of guys in like coveralls like measuring planters in my office and measuring pieces of art and stuff and I'm like what what are these guys doing here and like oh they're they're going to take everything to Richmond Virginia so they want to the planters the paint everything so I was like oh yeah things are changing so yeah our last day as the marketing division was December 17 2010 mm. so that was it and then um, 4 days later Mike and I had our first meeting to talk about what would eventually become Crown Heads, and by February of the following year, we were made the announcement that we were doing Crown Heads. There was no, there wasn't a non-compete. No, so no, 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 no. The only thing we had to do to fulfill um, the agreement with CAO at the time, which was being acquired by STG, was um, we had to come up with like a new brand and a, a marketing campaign, this, that, and the other. And once we did that, we were like free to go. Then you could get your severance and. Okay, so the genesis of Crown Heads, there, I know that there was a novel called Crown Heads. Really? Yes, back Didn't in know like that. 1910 or something. No kidding. It was okay. a novel. All right. Um, but you came up with Crown Heads. What was the genesis of the name? <laughs> it was, uh, it's from The Wizard of Oz. Okay. 1939 movie. Um, again, going back to December, like, we had our meetings. We were like, I was tasked with coming up with the name of the company, right? So I had all this little notebook of all these names that, that I would have, and I would text them to Mike. He would like some, I would hate some, vice versa. And then ones that we both liked, the, the attorneys didn't like, they said, you can't do this, that, and the other. So I was kind of like, oh, what am I doing, you know? So I, I remember watching The Wizard of Oz one day at home, and I screenshotted the, there's a scene where she goes to meet Professor Marvel before it goes to full color. And on the side of the caravan, it says, it says, crowned heads of Europe, past, present, and future. And I was like, I just liked crowned heads. There's something drew me to that name. So I texted it to, to Mike, and he's like, yeah, I kind of like that too. And it was ambiguous enough that the, the attorneys had no issue with it either. 
And um, so that became that became Ground Heads because I, I didn't want it to be like you know Condor Huber Cigar Company or I didn't want to be pigeonholed into anything that was like going to just lock us into that one thing. Right. So when you know it, in retrospect, you could kind of go into the spirits industry. You could go into co you could do a lot of different things with Ground Heads. Um, but then the whole conspiracy thing kind of came out. They're like, oh, I get it. C and H Condor Huber. There's all these little theories, and I'm like, that's very clever, but I didn't, I wasn't that clever. So oh, that's how it, how it came about. See, big music fan, before we get into the music and, and the cigars, which you have a nice connection with, um, go back to the Wizard of Oz for a second. Did you ever play uh, Dark Pink Side Floyd, of the Yeah, I saw that. Do that. No, I never did that. Try it. I've I never did that. that. And you you were you stoned it, when you did it? No. Okay. No. I, and and what the most amazing <laughs> part is, is... The, the the it's the tornado, okay, is the whirling sound, uh -huh. okay, during a tornado, and then the really definitive moment is as soon as that movie goes from black and white to color, is when the cash machine cranks for money. money. It's right on cue. That's funny. It's 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 eerie. You, you kind of I I know that that whole tale behind it, but I kind of go, who was the guy that was sitting home one day and decided I'm going to cue this up, and. <laughs> Who does that, right? right. And then it was like, becomes a thing. It becomes a thing. Yeah. So you have this. So you have this line. You, you start this 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 new company, mm. and you come out with a product called Four Kicks, <clears throat> which is there. Um, There's about a ten month period between the announcement and then Four Kicks okay. for sure. Yeah. And you come out with Four Kicks, and Four Kicks is um, a, a musical reference, <clears throat> right? Correct. And is that kind of like a kick to the industry saying, hey, we're coming in? What was the reason for four kicks? So the last four or five months while we were still at CAO, um, it'd be, I, had the, I played that song literally. Like I get, there's a bit of OCD to my personality and I just get like over and over kind of thing and I drive people crazy. Um, and I was playing that song over and over and then the lyrics are very rebellious, anti-establishment. I took it as rebellious and anti-establishment and that was kind of like our parting shot to the 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 corporation that kind of took our little team away and, and divvied up the whole family because I mean these these are guys that I worked with including the Osgren family but like our sales guys and everything we were like it was very unique it was like very much like a feeling like a fraternity like a brotherhood and um, you know to, to watch that just get dismantled is a little bit you know you kind of go you know what I mean you get that so that was that was an easy choice for the for the first first name of the brand, oh, okay. for, for first brand of the company, Four Kicks. And then you kept this thing. You said, okay, so you got this music reference, and then you came out with more musical references like Jericho Hill, Headley Grange came out. Headley Grange, Headley Grange, yeah. Headley Grange is a little bit more um, uh, subversive in terms of like you wouldn't know it's a musical reference initially, unless you really did the the, the R and D and see what was behind the inspiration but what the inspiration for Headley Grange was um, it was sonic it was literally like comparing sound to taste which sounds really abstract I know but um, I was again OCDing on when the levee breaks by Led Zeppelin yeah, absolutely so when you hear that that intro with bottoms drums like doom, 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 has a really thick kind of plodding heavy feel to it and I was like man and I just said I wish we could blend a cigar that tastes the way that sounds I wanted something thick and heavy and, and just really. And so I kept telling this to, to Condor, and he's just like, you're crazy. I said, let's call Ernie and see what, what he thinks, Ernesto Perez Carrillo. And I remember like yesterday, we, you know, we played the music for him on speakerphone, and it was silent. And I was like, he's like, okay. I said, well, I want to blend something that tastes like this sounds. And Condor's like, you know, rolling his eyes or whatever. And, and Ernie's like, okay, I got it, I, I understand. So we, we had that little bond. Well, it turns out he was a drummer at one point. Ernie was a drummer oh, okay. back in the day. So he kind of knew the whole Sonic kind of a thing. And so then we needed like the actual name for the brand, right? So there's a movie, another movie called um, It Might Get Loud, which is like a documentary with uh, actually Jimmy Page, um, The Edge, and Jack White. In that movie, Jimmy Page goes back to this this studio. In the studio, it's a house, right, right, in, right. In, in the UK. Where the Black Dog was. Well, yeah, exactly. It's, that's another allusion to it. But um, and they said, you know, this is where we create. We 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 recorded Bonzo's drums because the ceiling gave it that heavy. Like there was no, you know, 
sophisticated recording equipment. They literally mic'd his drums under here because it sounded like that. That building, that house was called Headley Grange. Right. So that's how we got, came up with the name. Now, now you were quoted once um, describing the creation of a cigar like creating a musical album. Probably misquoted, but I guess what I was trying to say was Crowned Heads was the group and I wanted to have the creative latitude under the group to create different albums that sounded differently as opposed to my previous life when it was CAO, everything was like CAO Brasilia, CAO Italia, CAO MX2, CAO LX2, CAO, 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 CAO. So I didn't, want to, I didn't want to get, you know, I wanted to be able to create different artwork, <clears throat> different, different blends, different anything under that umbrella. So these, that's how I've always looked at Crown Heads is like the group First album was Four Kicks, second album was Helly Grange, then J.D. Howard, then so on and so forth. And now we're at a crossroads in the company, you know, eight years into this, like, how do you tie that all together, right? Like, how do you let people know that we do all of this, this is our portfolio? Because that's one of the things that, that we run into is they go, yeah, I smoke your Las Calaveras. I'm like, well, if you had um, Jericho Hill, you guys do Jericho Hill? I didn't know you guys do Jericho Hill, you know? So it, it's kind of a double-edged sword at this right, point. Right, because you don't bit. necessarily recognize the Crown Heads brand right. on the cigar. You know the you know the brand. Mm -hmm. You know the brand is Jericho Hill, or you know it's a Los Calaveras, or you know it's a uh, Headley Grange. Right. But you don't know that. So the Los Calaveras is an interesting line. So you you have this musical reference and everything, and now you come out with uh, the Los Calaveras. What about six years ago? Seven years ago? Fourteen. So this is our sixth year doing the it. Sixth year, okay. Yeah. And that was a um, a cigar to uh, revere the dead, remember those that celebrate died. the lives celebrate of the people the that have passed have the passed. year before. Correct, correct. Okay. What made you come up with that? <clears throat> Something I've always kind of wanted to do. Um, I remember seeing the, the the initial artwork for the the Dia de los Muertos in an airport one time, and I was like, "Something here." I didn't, I didn't know what it was, but I just took a picture of it. Um, you know, it's always in the back of my mind with a bunch of ideas. And then in 14, in January, when we went down to start working with the Garcia family and my father, we, that was the original cigar that we were going to do with them, which was Las Calaveras 2014. Um, while we were down there, we also started playing with some other stuff, uh, which became Jericho Hill. Um, but it was, it was interesting because uh, with Las Calaveras, you know, it was going to be... I never knew it would take off the way it took yeah, it's off. It's a cult. You have a cult following. It's cr it's kind of crazy. Although Half Wheel may have just ended the the line for us last week, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's uh, if it's going to live to see another day. But um, yeah, it really took off. And I, I, ironically, I attribute a lot of that to that original Half Wheel rating um, when Charlie gave it a 94, and then all of a sudden it just was like it. You know, so I got to give him a lot of credit for that. Sure. Um, and of course the Garcias though, I mean, geez, you know, you're only as good as the tobaccos that you use and they just, they were so kind and gracious to let us use some of the best stuff that they have and they really, they always make a fantastic product for us. So, so each one of those Los Calaveras cigars has a very unique limited edition sourced tobacco in it. Correct. For each each year. Correct. <clears throat> They're going to be different blends on every year. Different blends, and then the, the Vitolas also change slightly. I think the only one that we've kept as a constant was the Robusto. Mm -hmm. That's the only one that's been in every year since fourteen. Now the new one that we just you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you you did something a little different with that. You you gave tribute now to your mentor. Yeah. Ausinger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, usually, there's four coins. There's two coins on each side of the band since 2014 and they've always had a different set of initials on each coin going back to you know certain people that either we lost in our families people here or that we've lost in the industry or the music industry or what have you um, and then we lost John o last year um, and I just felt like with this year's I, I couldn't imagine him sharing you know the so I was like this has to be all about John o. this has to be like one tribute for him because he just played such a huge huge role you know not just at CAO but just it, it transcended that I mean he was like a mentor for all of us he was like a father figure he was like he just taught us a lot about about life in general very mm -hmm. spiritual man good family man um, fun 
just a, just a very unique. You know, if I, it's a very short list of mentors that I can give you, but he's he's certainly up at the top of the list. Now, how, how do you? Um, let's talk just about blending and your process that you go through. Um, you obviously work with Ernesto. Um, does you give him an idea, or do you hands on with that? Initially, with four kicks, um, it was it was a lot hands on. Like Ernie was like, you know, the the process to even figure out who was going to make the first cigars for us was arduous. Like I told you, there was a ten month gap. The reason being is because when we announced the company in February, we didn't know who was going to make the cigars. The next step after we announced it was to Mike and I to get on a plane and go to Central America and start meeting people. And doors opened for us that maybe wouldn't have opened normally, and we had a lot of opportunities. And then we just came back and really evaluated all of those opportunities, which there was about 11 or 12 of them, um, on a diff various factors. And we just it honestly came down to one person at that time, which was Ernie. And then the trick was, is he going to make the cigar for us? Because at that time, he wasn't making cigars for anybody except EPC. He started EPC in 2009 with the inaugural, and this was 2011. And we're like, hey, would you make a cigar for us? And he was like, okay, but you guys have to come here and you guys have to be involved with the process. If this succeeds, congratulations. If it fails, it's on you. So it was kind of like getting my graduate degree, you know, as opposed <laughs> to like my undergrad degree at uh, CAO. Um, in that, like, you know, we went down and we were like working with tobaccos and validating to me. He was teaching me like, okay, this, while this is still, you know, Esteli from here and this, you know, let's say it's, you know, Esteli at, whatever, Esteli the Arrow, this one's from this farm and this one's from this farm and taste it and tell me what the difference is, you know, and, and regions and farms and primings and all of these things that went into it. So I really, it was very hands-on with four kicks. Um, you know, as time progressed, and then it would become like, okay, here's what I want. Let's play with this. What do you have that we can use and, and that kind of thing. And then also with the Garcias, it was, it was just like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. I want something that uses this wrapper i want something with this much body let's let's start from there and the funny story with las calaveras in 14 is literally when i gave them the the jumping off point my description of what i wanted they came back and i was sitting there with uh with pete johnson in fact because pete was very instrumental we were friends since 96 he was the entree to get into that factory and so they gave me like literally like three samples and I was smoking them, and I'm like, man, they're all good. And so I, I kind of did one of these with Pete, and I said, do me a favor. I said, smoke this and tell me what you think of it. And I was like, yeah, this is really good. He goes, it's, it's meaty. I remember he used the word meaty. It's meaty. It's, 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 it's got a lot of complexity, it's, it, but it doesn't taste like anything that's coming out of the house right now, so that's a good thing. But he wasn't, like, raving over it. And I said, well, I'm having an issue with it. And he's like, what, what's the issue? I said, I mean, they just brought me th only three, <laughs> you know, variations on the theme, but I really like this, you know, I don't, I can't imagine changing anything on this particular, and he's like, look, man, he goes, when you start with really good tobaccos, it's our job as brand owners, just don't fuck it up. That's literally what he told me, and it was a huge lesson for me that I still remember to this day. It's like, so when I hear stories or marketing schemes of like, oh, we had, you know, we worked on this blend for two years, and we went through this many pilones and this many vend, then you're not starting with good tobaccos, right? Yeah. So it shouldn't be that difficult. Shouldn't be super easy, but when you're working with some of the best people in the business, which we fortunately are with the Garcias and with Ernie, it makes your 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 job a lot easier for sure. I'm not gonna lie. So, so what's your favorite leaf to work with for a wrapper? I like Habano. Okay. I still like Habano. You know, I mean, um, there's a lot of we get a lot of broadleaf guys out there. They mm -hmm. they love broadleaf, and you know, I was just in the in our walk-in where I took you back there and the other day, and I was like looking for something to smoke, and nothing. Everything kind of looked homogenous to me. It was like everything's dark and heavy and brooding and da da, and that's probably why I went back to to yeah. Hadley with some Sumatra. You know, you just get kind of burned out on it for a minute. But I think Havano's a nice midpoint. Yes. You know, yeah. it's yeah. not like shade. It's not like Connecticut. It's not like Ecuador, Connecticut, and it's not like heavy and and you know if if your Connecticut's are over here and that's your 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 Chardonnays and your 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 uh, broadleafs are over here and that's your Bordeaux's and your Zins. 
you know, Habano's kind of nice. It's like a Pinot Noir. It's kind of nice right down the middle, you know. So I, I, that's probably my favorite leaf. And it's uh, the leaf itself is it's pliable. Mm -hmm. It's it's a good leaf to work with. And it seems like we can always it's always in a good supply, whereas broadleaf for us is sometimes it can be, you know, it's kind of harder to get a, get a hold of the of, of really good broadleaf Connecticut broadleaf. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, if I had to pick one, it would probably be Habano. So now this year you've come out with a number of new lines. Let's talk about those. Where do we begin? <laughs> well, we. You well, know, let's begin if with. If I go the, back into February, there was a Paniolo 2019, right. right? And that came out of Drew Estate, La Grand Fabrica de Drew Estate, um, and that was a limited edition that we did for Hawaii that went over very well. It's fantastic little five and a half by 48 cigar. I think we did 4,000 of those for Hawaii. Um, which is an annual thing that we've been doing since 2015. Every year we do Paniolo and change the blend for our, our good people in Hawaii. Um, and then we did Mule Kick 2019. We did a TAA 2019. We did, we brought back the Le Carême Bellicosos Finos for 2019. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, and we have a special guest appearance. Special guest appearance. Get out of the camera. What's up? Oh my goodness, sorry. Oh, you're good. You're Lost good. You're good. Look at you, you man. Can, you're right on look time. Look at those shoes, man. Are they a little too look at me? <laughs> I don't know. I'm They're just, a little bit. Uh, they match his, lace them. They match his backpack. Oh. <laughs> what a hipster. <laughs> it's like if you could take an M&M &M and dress them and, and <laughs> you know, it's like. You got a couple of M&M's? I got, got a couple of M&M's yeah, today. Um, what were we? Oh, so yeah, and then um, what? Las Calaveras, and then the trade show. We released Juarez, kind of opened that up to the masses, um, and then of course La Colación. And La Colación is a spectacular cigar. By thank the way. you, thank I mean, you. That is just spectacular. They, the Drew Estate family, took good care of you with that. Yes, we're very excited for that one. So I, that process, that was working a long process with Drew Estate. How did that all come to? together it, it sounds cliche that it was years in the making but truly it was in that i mean we john started talking to me gosh 2014 maybe 13 14 kept you know doing one of these at the trade show like hey i want to get you and willie together to do something i, said, I would love to you know and it never really got any traction but every year as we time progressed we would kind of sit down and talk a little bit more a little bit more and then about two years ago we had the first real meeting and then last year at the trade show, we had, you know, the real, okay, we've defined the parameters. We know what, what's expected from both parties. Now let's create a cigar, right? And I remember Willie and I were just like, let us go. Let us just do the, the cigar. We just, because over time, he and I became good friends. Every time he would roll through Nashville and do an event, he would always take a couple hours and come over here and we'd smoke and hang out. And I was always a fan of his style of cigar making. and. Um, but, you know, we talk about the kids and, and the families and the wives, and he's a really great guy. Um, so we were ready to go. You know, once they, they finally said, okay, we're, we're, we've come to terms, now we're ready to go. I was like, all right, let's do it. So I remember the funny story that I always kind of tell is, is at the meeting last year, um, one of their marketing guys, who's no longer there, said, okay, what we want to do is we want to take you and Willie and put you up in a cabin, like in Gatlinburg, for like a <laughs> week, just the two of you. And just see what you guys come up and we're just like and we're sitting across from each other we're just like no I mean, you know that ain't gonna happen and you know, we're not gonna it sounds like uh what was that broke back mountain or something you know <laughs> two guys up in a cabin together <laughs> sipping wine or something i was like no nah. and then it really just looked at me he's like do you like añejos and i'm like i'm in because to me like i'm a huge fuente fan from way back mm -hmm. like god like a mount rushmore for me and um I've always thought that, you know, Opus was a masterpiece, but Añejo, for me, really hit my palate. He's like, well, I've been messing around with some blends for the last year or so, and I, I've got some ideas. And I'm like, let's go. And that was the jumping off point, really, for what would become La Coalition. Now, how old is the leaf that's in that cigar? You would have to ask Willie, honestly. It's, that is an aged leaf. Um, it is. Yes. If people that like broadleaf, I mean, I, I can't imagine it getting any better. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know... It was that was the most organic, easy, fluid portion of the creation of the brand was the blend. I mean, like I told you before we got on camera, it was like, you know, he sent me up like a few renditions and I said, 
but left field, right field, center field, how do you, they're all home runs, <laughs> you know? It's like, well, you gotta pick one. Ironically, I picked the same one that he picked, and, um, and then we were off to the races. Then the, then all the other stuff came about, like, okay, what's it gonna be called? How many, the, well, let's talk about the range, let's talk about the sizes, let's talk about the packaging, let's talk about the marketing, let's talk about, and that was, it was all very collaborative, though. You know, I mean, working with not only just Willie, but also working a little bit with John, working with Josh and on and all their their team and, and Joey and Wade on our side. I mean, it, there was a lot of a lot of cooks in there, which was different for me because it, before then it was always like I kind of like was a control freak and I did everything, you know, and I, I wanted it to be a certain color and a certain way and a certain blend and a certain taste, certain size. But I really kind of like I let go of the wheel. I'm like, OK, let's let's all take turns driving and let's see what comes up and what comes out and that's what you get. So who designed the band for that? So that started at Drew with Joey um, and it, that was one of my, I was like really sticking to my guns on this because I told the guys that like the, the artwork has to start on your side and I remember pitching that on a conference call to Joey and Joey's in the room down there in Florida he said like, I'm covered up I got too much going on I can't do it you're gonna have to do it you guys and I'm like Oh, I, I want it to look like something different than otherwise it's just gonna look like another rendition of crowned heads and it's gonna look like a contract brand I want it to, you start it and then we'll get in and we'll we'll mess with it so he started the 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 branding and then we we he handed the ball off to us and then Wade and I got a hold of it and so yeah like this let's do this and then Wade designed like the edging strip and all the little details and the coins and all of that so they started it and we finished it. The band is beautiful. I mean, I, I like how it has the branding on it. You got the crown heads on the side, on the bottom. You got the Drew Estate logo on the side. You, you covered all the bases. And what I really liked about that band when you took it off is the teal color. It's like see through. Yeah. Right? You put it into the light, you just see right through that teal. I got a little news scoop for you. It's, it's, I can't resist it to not break the news here, but that's, that teal color is going to go away. I will. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's such a. I, so I have to keep that band. <laughs> you, you're the first one to know about that. Keep the band, but it's it's being changed before they they hit the shelves in October. Okay. Um, it's, it's, the truth be told, you know, and, and Drew will tell you the same thing. But they they were very proud of the release, so they were showing it at their booth. We were showing it at our booth, obviously. We we'll come right, come back to this. Okay. We can just wait until this guy moves. We'll wait till he moves away. By the way, I don't know if you're familiar with the, this company down in Dominican that has a Calaveras cigar. Not, know. It's, called, it's not called, it's got Calaveras. I forget the exact name. They sent me a couple of boxes to review. It's it's interesting. I, I've and seen Rocky the, do a rendition. It's got the of head it. and everything. No, no. You know, I don't really take so. offense to that stuff. So, really let, so let's go back. Let's just so swing this back. I'll cut this in. So okay. the teal. So we're gonna say so, yeah, that band's so gonna go away. The reason being, like I was saying, that, that you know they were showing it, we were showing it. Very, we were all very enthusiastic and and, and about the release. So after the show, um, I remember Willie telling. I said, "What are you thinking?" And Willie's like, "I hate the band." I was like, oh, man. "I was just excited to have something <laughs> done to show." And I'm like, "Oh, this looks great." I'm like, "Let's smoke it." Da -da -da. He hated the band. So and then John comes back and he says, "You know, I've asked." Uh, everybody their opinion all these retailers and he goes and I don't like the way that people told me that the band reminds them of an old quinky Blanco band do you remember that brand mm -hmm. and I was like yeah I, I get that I, I could see that he goes I, I don't like that I don't like that and so again going back to the fact that this is a true collaboration if one party has issue with something you got to have to compromise what have you so um, the, the band design itself isn't really changing but that particular teal is going to go away oh wow yeah so i will i will have to keep that band as a memento as a memento i'll, I'll frame it yeah <laughs> yeah but you'll you, you won't it's 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 very subtle it's very subtle that would the, the color change let's talk about musical references again so are you do you play an instrument i do not you do not no. okay um if you were to pick any band out there dead or alive to play for you at maybe a special birthday party or anniversary party, who would it be? Ooh, that's a, I've never been asked that question. Man, um, I mean like the obvious, 
you know, you could say the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or, you know, you could go there. But I would, you know, I would, I would probably throw a curveball on that and say like maybe Jane's Addiction or Sublime or um, maybe in Nirvana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know. That's just a little bit more my, my, you know, heyday, my, 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 my sweet spot. I mean, you know, the, the Stones, are they're, they're so iconic and everything, but I didn't really grow up with the Rolling Stones, but I did kind of grow up with Nirvana, Sublime, yeah. Jane's Addiction, and bands like that, so maybe yeah. Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses would but be a But it'd have to be the 91, 92 yeah. Guns N' Roses, not the, the bloated axle Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, it would be Aerosmith. Yeah, I saw Aerosmith. Well, Boston, Bob. right? Was, yeah, there yeah. you go. I well, saw, I saw him. Uh, what's the lead singer? Stephen Perry. Stephen. Stephen Tyler. Tyler. Stephen Tyler. I merged the two together. Yeah. Stephen Tyler in Deadwood at this dive restaurant. We were having cheeseburgers up in Deadwood, uh, South Dakota, and everybody kept looking at this guy. And I thought it was a girl, and looking at this girl, I'm like, "Who's that girl? What the?" No, that's Steven Tyler. He's up here on his. I was like, he was up there for the bike rally, but he was an odd-looking cat. He he's a he he's quite a uh, an interesting-looking man. Uh, I saw them actually warm up for Black Sabbath in 1976. Oh, wow. wow! And they, the funny story. He actually um, they they did the warm up, and they rocked the Madison Square Garden. They rocked the house. And the lights go out, uh, you know, they do the change of, you know, the instruments and everything. And out of the out of the top of the garden comes this big chrome cross and they're playing Iron Man as the opening song, right? Ozzy's getting it. And he says, stop the music. And he stops the music. And everybody's like, what the hell's going on? And he goes, Joe and Steve, can you come out here for a second? He brings him out on stage, and he looks at him kind of sternly, and he says, don't you know you're not supposed to blow the main act off the stage? <laughs> now get back in your locker rooms or whatever, you know. Oh, uh, wow. And they go on with the concert, and it was back in the day when, you know, concerts were three, four encores. Right. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> the last encore, they brought out both bands, and they jammed to four songs both Aerosmith and Black Sabbath songs. Wow. Two drummers, guitars, vocals, and just destroyed wow. this. I mean, the, the whole audience was just enamored by what was going on. And it was at that point, I wasn't a big Ozzy fan, but I was like, that's pretty cool. And then years later, I would go to OzFest, and I realized that Ozzy is a unique character because it's not about him. It's about everybody else. Yeah. It's about promoting all of these bands because he put Aerosmith on the map then, mm -hmm. and then Aerosmith obviously fell off the map with all their drug problems, and then they got together with Run DMC. And I they, remember and that. And then, yeah. and then they, they they've been superstars ever since, right? But one of the amazing, amazing stories. I think that's so a great experience. I, I would love imagine. to. I would love to have Stephen Tyler at my house and just just jam for a party. You know. See, I didn't even start listening to like rock and roll music till I think I was probably. 17, 18, I was in college. I, where I grew up, I grew up listening to like, like stuff like Parliament, Bootsy Collins, mm. Funkadelic, Ohio Players, uh, Zap Bam, I mean, just like very like, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what rock music was until I got to, to, to LA and then I was like, oh, okay, there's this whole other thing, you know. And I remember seeing the Red Hot Chili Peppers, that's another great band, but I saw the Peppers on the cafe the back of a cafeteria at USC and they had little flyers up you know red hot chili peppers and literally playing for like maybe if there was 12 people running around with like beers just hanging out and peppers are doing their thing and it's like nobody even paid attention to them that was like because they all came up from that same area and that same era but that was interesting I saw some good bands in LA oh I I, I remember the days Pearl man. Jam before they started a break I saw them at the at the palace I think it was called the Palace. Yeah, I got and out of the scene. I, I wouldn't say I was out of the scene. I always listened to it, but I never got back into concerts once I got into my, probably into my 30s, raising a family. Yeah. And, and you just, you know, you listen to it on the radio, and that that's what you had. And I go back, and I just remember the great concerts I went to years ago, and I could just close my eyes sometimes and just picture these concerts, the Rolling Stones, in 1975 in Madison Square Garden wow. 
completely wireless. Wow. Wireless. There was no, uh, nobody could understand what was going on. We thought it was all, you know, like fake. Yeah. And no, I mean, no, no wire on the mic. It's, you know, Mick Jagger swinging on a rope over the top of the audience. But you'll never see that Same. again. That'll never come back. It's like, That's crazy. crap, man. And, 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 and it was just flat out amazing. Interesting. So when you get into, so you, you, you've been smoking cigars for how long now? I think the first time I smoked a cigar was like 94, 95, something like that. Okay. So yeah, I mean, and then I got into the business pretty quickly. It's like that, once I was kind of introduced by accident to cigars, I, I was, was like, gonna ask you that, how you that's got how, I was actually going back to California to, for like, I think Thanksgiving or something. and. I wanted to get my my father a gift, and I was like looking for like a guy's gift, like what you know, what do you what do you get? And I remember seeing this cigar store in Green Hills, not too far from here, called Uptown Smoke Shop. And I literally just I'm gonna go get him some cigars. So I walk in, and it was like tons of people in there. I go into the humidor, and I was like, the smell of the cedar and the tobacco, and it, I was just like, it was like, boom! I'm like, I'm home. What is this? This is amazing, right? And so this guy comes over and helps me and he says, what are you looking for? And I was just like, so then after that trip and after I smoked that cigar, I come back and I find this, this cigar fishing out a magazine with George Burns on the cover in a wine store. And I take that and I just devour it. And I'm like reading and reading. <laughs> and like every week I'd go back to this Uptown store and whatever money I had, I would like go and try to, I'm like, do you have this cigar? It was rated 90. No, we're all out. Do you have this one that's 80? And that's how I bought my cigars. And then I'd go back and I'd had this little five by seven note card book and I would take my notes, you know, put the, the, the band in there and glue it. And I just became the cigar geek, right? And then one day I remember seeing this, I was reading a newspaper and it says local, you know, cigar company in Nashville. And it was this big piece on CAO. I'm like, I was like, I get, you know, I gotta get, get a gig here or something. And I, at that time I'd written letters to everybody in Cigar Fishing on Magazine. Every company that had an address at the bottom of the advert, write him a letter. I even wrote Cigar Aficionado a letter and said, hey, I'll be your Southeastern correspondent. I had no filter. I was just going for it. <laughs> and to his credit, Gordon Mott wrote me a very, very polite rejection letter. Um, I even tried to get a job at Uptowns, the cigar store. They, not, they wouldn't even hire me for seven bucks an hour. I couldn't get arrested, right? <laughs> Literally, that was my last chance was CAO. And, uh, and John took a chance on me. Oh, that's amazing. It was pretty that's cool. a great story. Yeah, I was, I was bound and determined to get a job in the business, but I, it, it just became like that, this is what I have to do. It wasn't even about money or, or anything. It was just like, this is all I want to do. So, and that's, haven't worked a day in my life since, really. There you go. You History's know. told. Yeah, man. That's amazing. So well, now, when you, uh, what's your favorite beverage to pair with a cigar? Coffee. Coffee. Coffee or, you know, if I'm like going through blends that need a taste is just keep it clean, keep it with water. Of course. Of course. But um, yeah, I gave up spirits about nine years ago. And then I just became a beer and wine guy, the occasional beer. And then I really got into wines for a minute. And then about four months ago, I just, I gave that up altogether too. So I'm completely like, that's really the only thing I can pair it with is, is coffee, coffee or water. Did you ever try it with tea? No. So I met the, there's a, there's a cigar shop in Wisconsin who has can, the woman that owns it, the husband wife team, Lake Country Cigars, sure. I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. She has a group called the Cigar Babes. And the Cigar Babes, um, they travel down to the Central America and they do a lot of fundraising. They bring clothes down and they take care of the people in the industry. Mm -hmm. And they go around the different shops to kind of run these fundraisers. And I met them at uh, my local shop in Melbourne once. And we, um, we got to talking and they um, did a whole survey of women cigar smokers. And it's an amazing survey. It's published on my site. They gave me the rights to publish it all stuff. And they, you know, it's the largest growing demographic. They, they, that time, right? okay, it was a couple of years ago, women cigar smokers have just taken over, right? They, they, you gotta appeal to them, and it's not they don't smoke because they want the light bodied flavored cigars, they smoke for the same reasons we do. They want the flavor, they want this. And she said, What they do is they have these events and they pair it with they have tea, good tea, good Earl Black teas, things like okay. that. She says, You need to try that. 
So I did. It's a completely different experience. Really? Because the tannins in the tea, mm-hmm. right, gives you that little dryness, opens up the palate, right? Different than the tannins in the coffee. Interesting. All right. So you get a chance, just just drink an Earl Black tea. Okay. No lemon or anything. Just drink it black. I give it a shot. And smoke a cigar with it, and you'd be I'll like, give it a shot. "Wow, what? A, it's a different experience." I just like I go back to you know my memory of. of Pairing spirits with cigars, though, and I always was was partial to rum. Rum was, I, you know, all the old Good Cuban, rum. yeah, the old Cuban guys will say like that's that's what you drink with a cigar is real yeah, rum, yeah. you know, because you get that sweetness and you know it has yeah. it's good good flavor to it. I, I do enjoy sipping rum with a cigar. Um, I did get hooked lately. I was over in I was over in Dublin a couple of years ago on vacation, and I traveled through Ireland for week and a half and I got hooked on Irish whiskey and I'm not talking Jameson's and Bushmills right there are these craft Irish whiskeys yeah there are 19 new distilleries opening up right now they're gonna start hitting the US market huh. and you're beginning to see them on the on the shelves like one brands called like red breast right? I've heard of it actually and red breast yeah. has got this kind of uh, uh, a spicy, peppery note with a honeyness to it, and it is just so pleasurable. Yeah, smoking a cigar with it, and the price point of the high-end Irish whiskeys versus a high-end Scotch, which is I would compare them on the same level, is like half the price. Right, you can get like a Lagavulin for a hundred dollars. You can get one of these for like sixty bucks, and it is just. As good, if not better. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm a big whiskey guy when it comes to. I used to be cigars. too. I, I was I was a big whiskey yeah, guy. I just a little I bit too it. too big of whiskey. Yeah. That's why I, I had to give it up. I had to retire from the sport. I got that problem. I, I bought we, a, you know back in the old days at CAO, it was like we we had like our own lounge, like with a very nice bar and everything, and it was just like whatever you want, anytime yeah. you wanted, you yeah. know. And towards the end, it just got to be like part and parcel like it's four o'clock let's go let's start having <laughs> you know on a Tuesday at four o'clock yeah, you start yeah, drinking yeah. whiskey and smoking cigars and then next thing you know you're going out at night and you're doing the same thing you wake up the next and it's just, it gets to you you know yeah of course you it know does. so it's a long road yeah so how, how often are you on the road now um, it's you know I, I, I I'm not really I don't do in stores and that was for an intentional reason like when Mike and I first got together to, to define the structure of what would become crown heads I was like, I want to build equity in the brands, not in the personalities, right? Because that's one thing I don't really understand about this, the cigar industry today is how everybody is so, like, celebritized, right? right? Because you go into any other industry, like, when I was drinking wines, I, like, there were certain wines that I really liked and enjoyed, but I didn't know who the vintner was, and I didn't know anything, about, and I don't want him to sign my bottle, and I don't want a picture with him. For some reason, though, in the premium cigar world, everybody started to celebritize the brand owners, right? But we don't make the cigars, we don't roll the cigars, we don't, we're not heroes or anything like that. But it, I noticed that like certain brands, like if the owner was there, they would sell 50 boxes. Yeah. The owner leaves and it's like, it just disappears. So I was like, it's gonna be longer and harder to develop brand loyalty and really get people onto our stuff, but I, I want them to get onto the stuff, the cigar, not the brand owner. So I don't really travel a lot for in stores. But when I think about like this past year, you know, January, I was in the DR at the factory. We had a sales meeting. February, I was in Hawaii. March, I was in uh, the Dominican for a trade show. You know, I had April off and then May, I was in Charlotte for a couple of events for a friend. Uh, I was in Charleston. um, Then I was in Vegas. So while I don't think I travel that much, I look back and I kind of go, oh, yeah, I guess I do get out, you know. So but I'm not that guy that's like doing this, 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 and next week, I'm blah, 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 and that's what our, our sales guys do. So a few years ago, you brought in Miguel, mm-hmm. who is, uh, I have National great, sales manager. great respect for Miguel. Yeah. I treat him as one of my, my friends in this industry. Um, we've always shared ideas and thoughts. So how's he doing? He, he, he's the one that runs around. He's, he, is, he works a lot. Like I know we were on the phone like Friday, and. He's like, he goes, we're, we're, we're pushing it, man. He goes, I've been home in my own bed for, you know, four days out of the last 30, right? Um, so he, he's a very hard worker. I, truth be told, I had wanted to get Miguel on board 
a lot earlier than we finally got him. And he would tell you the same, but this was like the third time that we made him an offer. You know, the first time he, we were pretty close and then he went in a different direction. Second time we were like, I, we got him, right? Two weeks later, he's like, no, I, no, I'm not gonna do it. I was like, oh God. So for whatever reason, we went after him again. The third time was a charm. So, but now we got Miguel, we've got four in-house uh, regional guys. And then we got a couple of brokers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're building it like brick by brick kind of the thing. It's taken longer than I thought it might have, but in this climate and the way the business and the industry is as a whole, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. So what was your biggest challenge getting Crown Heads launched and getting it to the level you're at now? It's, it's an ongoing challenge. It was, it's not like we, we got to a place and we're like, okay, good, we're, we're fine. We're, you know, it's, every day it's, it's something else, whether it be FDA, whether it be, you know, what, you know, PCA versus IPCPR, all, <laughs> you know, it's like there's, I just try to keep my blinders on and, just, just, and focus on product development, on, you know, uh, marketing, uh, on exposing the brand, having a, like a long-term picture of it. Mike is more the business mind of the of the duo, where he'll like look at forecasting, projections, purchase orders, uh, you know, cash flow, which is essential. Um, and Adam is pretty much the the backbone that kind of implements all of that kind of stuff. And I, I'm I'm pretty you know blessed to be able to just be the creative element of it. So, um, but to answer your question. It, the, the, the biggest challenge to get it going from the beginning was really figuring out, you know, what is this company going to be and who is going to implement what's up here into a tangible product. That was the biggest challenge, really. And then we are fortunate to be able to work with Ernie to this day and the Garcias to this day. And it's, you'd be hard pressed to think of two better factories and then adding, you know, Drew Estate into the mix. It's like, yeah, it's, it's There's some big big hitters there. Yeah, and then we're also doing stuff with, uh, you know, you, you're, you were smoking Juarez, but that's made by a Tabacalera Pichardo, which is, um, yep. I came into contact with those good people through Miguel. Um, like a couple of years ago, Miguel introduced me to them, and they were just kind of like this little hidden, yeah, right? Really kind of, I was like, man, but they were giving me samples that I was smoking. I'm like, this is really good. Can they do this on a consistent basis to build a line? kind of a thing, that's what we were thinking. And then um, Juarez came in to pass last year. We just opened it up this year to everybody, but we, we started doing Juarez with them last year. Um, and now, they've, now they're ace prime. That's, yeah, they made it, I was gonna they say. Were they like, they a, came out of nowhere with this like. They made a huge splash yeah. at the show this year. I was year. like, Luciano, I was like, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it was just like zero to 100, like overnight, they just went, yeah. you know. Yeah, and uh, That yeah. was just. Uh, it's crazy. That, that was like. Who, who are they? And they just, they made a big splash at the mm -hmm. show, for sure. Does this cross into their portfolio, or is this just... So the, what, what this started off, it, you know, like I told you, like a couple of years ago, they were giving me all these samples that I was smoking that I was really into. And at that time, our German distributor, Dali Zagarden, um, was expressing interest in us doing an exclusive for Germany. And you got to remember, like, we didn't think we would make a dent in Germany. Like, Sally, the, the owner, basically approached us a couple years ago and said, hey, would you have a distributor? I'm like, no. Do you want one? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Give, give it a shot. You never, How's this going to get off the ground? Nobody knows who we are. They've done a huge job with, for uh, the brand with us. I mean, I've got guys over there that have tattooed CYOP or, um, on their wow. knuckles and, you know, monkey cigars. Um, and you know they have huge events for Crown Heads where people are getting tattoos of the brand, and we just do it. And, and monetarily, they become like one of our top 10, 12 customers out of you know we're in 900 doors. So we we blew into Germany pretty big. It's a big market. Germany. It is. We we learned that. So they, they, hats off to those guys. But um, so I started playing with these blends from Tobacco Lara Pichar though, and I would send them to 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 Sally. And, no, we don't like it. No, we don't like it. So I had this one. I'm like, okay, this is what they want. They wanted something that was like reminiscent of Jericho Hill, a lot of structure, a lot of intensity, good cigar. So I'm like, all right, this is it. So I send this to them, and they passed on it. I was like, I, I'm, all right, we're going to table this German exclusive thing for a while. I'm, this isn't really working out. So meanwhile, Condor comes back to me and says, hey, we have an opportunity 
Thompson Cigar approached me and they want us to do a catalog exclusive. Do you have anything you've been working on that you can, and I said, well, actually, I've got something pretty good that we can plug in. And then it became Juarez. So we entered into an exclusive agreement verbally with Thompson in like October, delivered the first round, and it just was like crickets. Like they didn't promote it, nobody knew oh, about it. It was just like in a warehouse somewhere, I think. And I was like, I was getting frustrated with it. I'm like, well, this is really a great opportunity. It's a great value cigar. It's, it checks all the boxes. And then they get acquired by Cigars International. Now it's really lost, right? Now it's like nothing is happening for six months, seven months. So right before we go to the trade show, I told Mike, I'm like, why don't we try to just take a stab at this and open it up to everybody? We need, we'll bring it into the show and see what happens. And so I told our sales guys, I said, here's how you sell this cigar. Just give a sample to a customer, have them smoke it, ask them what they think, and then tell them the barrier of entry is less than $6. And it was like, how many do you want? Boom, 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 wow. boom. And now we're on back order. So it, it, it blew out. It just went huge. And, that's, and it says a lot about the consumer, right? That says, you know, we, we get into this mode 2015, late 14, 15, when we knew that these regulations are going to come upon us, and then the FDA and their infinite wisdom says, hey, premium cigar is defined as one of the parameters being priced $10. Yeah. So if we were going to do an exemption, it would be $10. Right. And of course, we all know that's a bullshit. Right. Right. But it was at that point I started to see the prices of cigars go up. Okay. Then everybody was testing ten dollars, and they hadn't come down for a number of years. And the consumer, let's be real, they're going to go into a shop, and they got so much they're going to spend on a cigar. And when you get anything in the ten to twelve dollar range, you're in a different market, mm -hmm. right? And that's a tough market to be in. Absolutely. Right? Now you give somebody that six or seven dollars, that's a great cigar for six seven dollars. Like you just said, it moves right very quickly. Um, you know, does the sh the shop makes a little less on it, but we they, do too. they make it up in volume. <laughs> right, right, right. So, mm. so <coughs> let, let, last question I ask everybody Absolutely. the Take same time. the same uh, the same question because um, I'm trying to gather some some intel on this. Um, so we, we all know we've gone now to the PCA Premium Cigar Association. I kind of like the name. Yeah, I, I, too. I think the branding on that's smart. Um, but they want to do this cigar con thing, and I've talked to retailers and I've talked to brand owners, and I've got different opinions from everybody. Um, what is your view on cigar con? Well, I think the name is kind of weird. Yeah, the con. I guess because from the Comic Con thing, yeah. right? The concept, though, I'm, you know, and I was asked this question like at every interview I did at IPCPR, and in, in, you know, last month, they always ended with that same question yeah. that you're ending yeah. with because we're all gathering. And I'm like, now. why is this even a controversial thing? What? I don't understand it. Why are people poking holes at it? And I'm, I'm like, my viewpoint was, okay, I'm going to be here, you know, doing a trade show for the trade. If they want to open the doors one day to, let's say, three or 400 consumers. 4,500 consumers. Okay, they're not going to get 4,500 consumers. <laughs> That's their goal. Then God bless them if they get 4,500. I don't think they will. <laughs> but whether it's 400 or 4,000, if those guys are paying money and flying out to Vegas and want to see, you know, uh, Nick Melillo or Steve Saka or Pete Johnson or John Huber or whatever, God bless them. Like, why wouldn't I take that opportunity? to spend a day shaking hands, taking pictures, sign some stuff, whatever, answer some questions. That's, I mean, that's the least we can do, it, especially when given that it the, the money raised would go back to support our legal efforts th that were, we, we gotta come, this costs money. Oh, absolutely. Millions of dollars to get <clears throat> attorneys to fight so that we can do what we do and perpetuate the, the industry. Why is anybody poking holes with that? Well, at the press conference that they had <coughs> for the media, so we had a private press conference with them on this. One of the questions, um, Charlie, you know, Half Wheel, actually asked a really good question: was when do you, when do you project to be profitable on CigarCon? Mm -hmm. Right? And they said two to three years. But based on what you just said, I, back in my mind, I always said, well, two or three years. 
be profitable. That means you got to fill a gap of loss. So you, it's costing you money to run CigarCon for the first couple of years. Where's that money coming from? It's coming from that fight, that battle. So you're going to take the money out of the legal fund? So why don't we fight the battle first? But to fight the it's like, you know, why did the chicken cross the road, right? Because to fight the battle, it's going to cost money, right? So if we're not, gonna, if we're not willing to do our part and try to help raise money, then you know everybody's gonna. Then, then when the industry goes away because the FDA has shut it down, everybody's gonna be like, "What, what happened?" happened? Right. You know what I mean? It's the one constant that I, I find in this industry, and I've been doing this since '96. So I've, I've been. I'm not like I just started doing this. You know, I've been seeing a lot of things. The one constant that I can tell you that I've seen is people complain about everything. Yes, they do. Right. They'll get an so, opinion on some. The trade shows in New Orleans. Everybody complains. I'm not going because it should be in Vegas. Okay, then the trade show comes back to Vegas. I'm not going because it's at the Sands Expo and it should be, at, or it's at the convention center and it should be at the Sands Expo, wrong venue. Okay, then we could go back to the new venue, right? Go back to the, where people wanted to, oh, I'm not going because it's too close to 4th of July. You know, and then you hear the complaint, like, I, do you see some of these people? Like, you can roll a bowling ball down the, 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 the thing and not hit anybody. There's nobody here, the attendance is down. Attendance is the same as last year. Every year, people complain. And now we're at a point where people are complaining about what they're trying to do to our industry, but nobody wants to get their hands dirty and try something different to get a different result. Because the one thing you know in life, it's like if you want the same results, keep doing the same thing. Yeah, right. 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 That's so true. here comes these guys that want to change the interject some life into the show, change it to PCA, bring in some consumers, try something new to get a different result, and everybody's like, oh no 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 no, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's bad for the business. It's bad for the business. They're gonna. You know, it's gonna take too many samples to give it to people and da 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 all this stuff. Bullshit. It's like do something, you know? Get your hands dirty. How many people have actually contacted, you know, a, a politician and said this is wrong? Right. Right? right? right. Nobody. Everybody wants to sit back you and everybody do the work letters. for them. I write the letters. You gotta there write you the go. letters. Exactly. You gotta yeah. get your hands dirty. Because then, you know, if it does all go away, at least we gave it a shot. Right. Right. So I, why there's controversy about this is, is beyond me. I don't know. Maybe well, that, that I'm not hearing something that everybody else is hearing. The retail, so on the, so on the retail side, what I hear from retailers is a slightly different opinion and their view is, well, first of all, they want to do it on the first day of the show, uh -huh. okay, which just happens to be a Saturday, right? People fly in on Friday night, consumers come in, they're only there for one day, six hours, so that's the time they can have it, and then they can fly home on Sunday okay. or they can spend an extra day and hang in Vegas. But the retailers look at it and say, well, that's like they're Biggest day, they, 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 the trade show is there to do business to business transactions, mm -hmm. and they feel that they're cutting into that day because a lot of these guys don't want to stick around on the Monday or the Tuesday. They get back to their shops, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Well, that's really not helping me," and they're going to have to chaperone there. But is it helping the industry? You got to look at what the retailer is going to want to do. The retailer wants to make the business deals, and. We've lost a little bit of that in the in, in, in the show because it used to be deals were always at the show, but now they get deals earlier. So there's a whole d dynamic that's yeah. changed on on it. True, and the retailers look at it and go, no, they and they have to chaperone their their patrons that they bring with them, right? Because you're going to buy these tickets at the at the retailers, right? And then they show up and they're going to have to walk them through and there's how do you move 4,500 people is, there, is what they need to mm -hmm. be profitable, right? Because they're going to come up with special, uh, they have to invest in, in equipment to do this because they're going to have special barcode readers, they're going to be able to get so many cigars, in different. they can have different zones, they said. I, I have to interrupt you and say, I think that those people are saying these things are so consumed by the minutia of it. They're talking about six hours, they're talking about one day, they're talking about, I do this 365 days a year. Retailers, this is your livelihood. You're doing this 365 days a year. You can't devote one day, two days, three days to invest in your industry, in your business, to go out to the trade show and support your trade, then you shouldn't be doing what you're doing the other 361 days of the year, in my opinion. If you're not invested enough into your industry that you can't take four days away and figure out how you're going to get somebody to cover your cash register or something, and if you're not coming out, to, people that retailers that don't go to the trade show, it, it bothers me so much. 
It really does because if you're not really, then you're not invested in the industry. You shouldn't be doing this. If you can't take just that small window of time and, and overcome the logistics of escorting people around for six hours, this one day of your life of the year, it's like, come on, I, I don't understand it. And it's like, it's the same thing. Like, I'll give you, for instance, I was on, uh, on social media, somebody contacted me asking about this one cigar that he loved that we do. And he said, and I said, well, who's your local? You know, I'll try to point you in the right direction. I'm trying to support brick and mortar, push, pushing people to buy the product. Well, my local won't, won't pick it up. I said, if you ask him to order it, he won't order it. That's the same guy or a type of guy that's going to complain that he's losing business to online, to, to the catalogs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't want to like pick up the phone and or send an email and say, hey, give me three boxes of this, I got a customer, then what? He's asking you to buy this and you're not and it's it's a done deal. So you're going to flip it and you're going to make money. But if you're not doing it and then you're going to complain that, oh, online is, you know, online's killing us. No, you're killing yourself. Yeah. It's the same mentality. If you don't go into, if you don't go to the trade show and you don't support it, you're killing yourself. Can you imagine if like we didn't go to the trade show? Oh, forget about it. Right. There is no trade show without the without without the without the manufacturers. If we didn't go, but that's kind of the same thing because I look at this as a, a multi-tiered business. And in other words, you know, it's one thing for us to sell to the retailer, and the retailer has to sell to the end con consumer. But if you're not willing to do your part, then why are you doing this? That's my question. It's well, good. That's good. John. It's a pleasure. Jimmy, pleasure. Thank you for sure. stopping by, man. Oh, absolutely. I yes. was been up here a couple of times visiting my son, and I kept saying, I got to get in to talk to you guys. Thank you. I appreciate, backyard, you, taking, man. I appreciate you taking so, the time. So we I have, appreciate you taking the time. It was really good. So I appreciate Excellent. it. Excellent. Thank so, you. So John Uber, Crown Heads, check out the new products they have. You'll be blown away. Check out the latest review we just did on their coalition. It is Thank you. spot on. Thank you. You're going to love it. Cheers. All right. Thank you, my man. Thank you so much for taking the time. It was a pleasure. I could have kept going on and on.